Great. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Olga, and for the uh, invitation to speak to the group today. Uh, yeah, so I'm a faculty member at the University of Rochester in, uh, in upstate New York in the United States. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a bit about the work that we do with NV centers in two different areas of the lab that I have. Before diving into the, the meat of this talk, I did want to provide an overview of the variety of activities we have going on in my lab. So yeah, we do work really that sits at the intersection of quantum optics, nano optics, and, and condensed matter physics. And some of the programs really live at the nexus of these three areas. Uh, other, other programs we have go maybe sit in two or one of those. Uh, and I'm just gonna kind of walk you around the slide giving you a bird's eye view of the different things going on in the lab. If you're interested in any of these, please get in touch with me and we can talk about them uh, at, at a later date. I do wanna say, I know this is a seminar, so I'm happy to keep this very informal. I hopefully keep the talk to about 40 minutes, but uh, if there's any questions throughout, please ask. I can't see the chat. So if someone puts something in the chat, maybe Olga, if you see that, you can just can stop me with the question and I can, I can respond then. Mm -hmm. Great, so starting here on the left, uh, kind of far removed from what I'll talk about today, but definitely informed by some of the stuff we're doing with, with, with quantum sensing is we, we have a big activity in, in using tools of quantum information science to understand the classical electromagnetic field. Uh, the idea there is that you can express the electromagnetic field or beams of, of the electromagnetic field as vectors in multi-dimensional vector spaces. When you make that identification, we, we like to think of the electric field living in kind of a fictitious Hilbert space, but then you can import all of the machinery people use to, to, to develop approaches or, or constraints on quantum systems and quantum information science and, and use them to help understand and inform us about classical optics. So that area has been very fruitful recently. I will speak a little bit today about, uh, in the latter half of the talk, uh, an area that we've been working on now for almost a decade. Uh, and then we, we refer to this as levitated optomechanics. This is optical tweezers uh, in high vacuum. I won't say more about that since that, 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 that's kind of a teaser for later on in the talk. Uh, we have a variety of, of programs in advanced sensing and seam characterization. Uh, we'll, we'll speak, I'll speak a little bit more about that. Also in the context of NV Center, uh, our quantum diamond microscope, but we also in this area do things in near field optics. Uh, also, we are, are using tools of quantum metrology and quantum measurement to understand fundamental limits in our ability to extract information from a scene and then use that information to either estimate parameters or, or make tests of hypothesis. Uh, and those systems involve not necessarily making a direct image of a scene that we're interested in learning about, but measuring the energy we receive in sort of um, ways that are informed by the, the quantum measurement machinery. In the, in the space of nanophotonics and, and condensed matter systems, we are, we are really interested in ways, as Olga was saying, to use nanostructures to, to modulate or control the flow of electromagnetic energy. Uh, we have a big effort in using metamaterials and metasurfaces and in both individual optical components as well as optical system design. Uh, most recently, we demonstrated a, a component we called a, a metaform, which was a marriage between a, a meta surface and a freeform optic. The, the value of that particular component within an optical system is captured in this artist's rendition of an augmented reality glass. So the, the curvature or the geometry of the eyeglass is very much understood as a freeform optic. We graft a meta surface or nanophotonic antennas into this special optical component. And this is the this then metaform could serve as the as the element that fuses the, the virtual and the real world for the user of these of these glasses. And last uh, but not least, we, we have a, quite a lot of work in, in quantum optics and our, our twist on quantum optics is we, is we like to work with solid state materials. These could be uh, artificial systems grown through techniques like molecular beam epitaxy, or they could be defects that exist in solid state materials. And I'm of course gonna talk quite a bit about one of our favorite defects in solid state materials, the, the nitrogen vacancy center. So today's talk uh, is gonna focus on two efforts we have in the left, in the lab, uh, on the left. 
is, um, is a, a photograph of our quantum diamond microscope. So we have two microscopes that we've built. This one is a wide field imaging system. So in a single shot, it lets us interrogate a fairly wide field of view. Uh, here is the, the, what you see here is the detector. Uh, here's where the sample sits and I'll, and I'll go through the details of the components that, that live in that instrument in, in a slide or two. A second effort where uh, NV centers and nano diamonds are, are, are particularly interesting to, to work with is this is an optical tweezer in high vacuum. So there's the vacuum chamber. This is another photograph of a nanoparticle that is trapped in this high vacuum tweezer. And then we dump a little bit of green laser light into it to, to give the, the, in the photograph the sense of where the, the particle is just kind of levitating there in space. Now, both of these instruments use as their kind of quantum active substrate uh, nano diamonds containing NV centers from, from, from Atomos. So uh, all of the, the data that you see on NV centers throughout the rest of the talk have come from material that, that we've purchased from, from Atomos. First, starting with the, the diamond microscope. So, you know, why, why go through building something like this? Or what's the, what's the added value? And I, I, I see sort of three different strands to why one would want to do this. Uh, if you're someone who's interested in optical microscopy, uh, you know, optics is good for microscopy because in many ways it's a non-destructive approach to learning about an object. Uh, and, and when you marry this with uh, features of an NV center, it gives you opportunities to circumvent the diffraction limit imposed by far field optical microscopy and spectroscopy. So you get an enhancement in the spatial resolution of your instrument. And you'll see in one of the example applications where this spatial resolution improvement is pretty valuable. You can also uh, use strategies of quantum control uh, with the, 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 that essentially drive the spin photophysics of an NV center. And that quantum control allows one to, to achieve a sensitivity to the signal you want to measure that has what we like to refer to as a quantum advantage. So you outperform the sensitivity of a classical sensor when you're trying to learn about a parameter of interest. Last, uh, and, I, and I don't think, certainly not least, and maybe it, you know, it isn't quite as appreciated as the former two is that the, the Envy Center is actuated by a number of different features of its environment. So if you operate this system in the right way, as a sensor, you, you have the opportunity to do multimodal sensing. And I'll give an example of how we use this, this ability to actuate different features of the spin photophysics to learn about different properties of the environment. And so why, you know, that's the why. So what, what do we do with this? I mean, I'll give some examples of uh, uh, inspection of a, of a kind of simple semiconductor device, but, but kind of looking forward, I think we're, we're starting to, to work with groups that allow and help them understand more sophisticated devices. There's opportunity in, in condensed matter physics, in particular studying uh, two-dimensional materials that are in some sense atomically or single layer materials that uh, possess interesting, in our example, magnetic properties. And another, another uh, application area I'll tell you a bit about is uh, paleomagnetism and geophysics. maybe talking to a room of experts on this. Uh, this, this can be quick, but you know, what, you know, what's exciting with our NV centers is we shine green light on them, we get red light out, and the, the details of the, of the spin Hamiltonian and how that engages the optics provides a, a really nice platform to learn about the NV center environment if things are done just right. So the, the Hamiltonian is nice in that, that it has a, a zero field energy that can shift with temperature. Uh, there is a strain splitting that can also result in shifts of, the, of both the spin and the excited states of the NV center. And then there is a, a, a magnetic field sensitivity in the spin ground states, as well as the excited states that will shift upon application of a magnetic field. So the takeaway here is if you can isolate the ability of this system to engage these different fields, be it temperature, some kind of strain, magnetic field, there's an opportunity, uh, opportunity if things are calibrated right to learn about those properties of the environment. Now, this is the electronic structure of the NV center. It consists of a spin ground state that is a triplet. So we have the zero and plus or minus one and their excited states um, under application of an external field, these states split and the 
uh, ability to imprint spin physics onto the optics happens via the way the excited states transition back down to the ground state, either radiatively or non-radiatively. If you happen to be in one of the minus or plus one ground states and you become optically excited up to the plus or minus one manifold, you have a somewhat efficient pathway to, to decay back down to the ground state non-radiatively instead of radiatively. The net result is the photoluminescence or light that comes back from the system, this red stuff, is slightly less. And so it's indicated in this curve over here, there are particular frequencies where we were able to put the ground state population if everything was to start in our zero state, either into the minus one or the plus one. And so if we've done that just right, then there's a reduction in the fluorescence as compared to if the system started in the zero state. So if the microwave frequency is such that it doesn't really drive population in the ground spin state manifold to the minus or plus one states, then we get some amount of photoluminescence out. We normalize that signal. So it's one when we're away from that transition. So that when we're on the tradition transitions, we see that reduction, All right? And so this type of curve where we now measure the red light that comes out under the application of a microwave field that we scan the frequency, doing this for this particular example with a finite external magnetic field to break the degeneracy. As we sweep that microwave frequency far away from the ground state spin resonance, we get quite a bit of light out. That light reduces when we have that transition to the minus one, to the plus one, and then it returns when we scan our microwave back through. I've also decorated this um, optically detected magnetic resonance curve with how things change under the application both of a magnetic field, so we get a shift as we see here between these two dips so that the amount of that shift is controlled by the strength of the external magnetic field. And this is, is, is somehow how the frequency shifts with the change in that magnetic field. And then also the center, right, is told to us by the Hamiltonian is gonna de be determined by the temperature of the system. So if it's hot, it goes one way. If it's cool, it goes the other way. So here splitting and center are our our fingerprints of what's going on in, in the environment with regards to both temperature and magnetic field. And so we take advantage of that feature or that property in our quantum diamond microscope. A bit more detail, the system is enveloped in um, three axis Helmholtz coils. And what that lets us do is control the magnetic field seen by our sample, which sits right in here. The sample itself lives in the middle of this microwave antenna that gets plugged in on top of our three axis piezo stages that let us scan the sample into the focus of our objective. It's a relatively low NA objective with large working distance. So we have a lot of real estate to, to move stuff around or put stuff in underneath it. Uh, that microscope objective uh, serves a dual purpose. It focuses that green light that excites optical transitions in the NV center. And then it also delivers the fluorescence light back up to not a point detector, but a CMOS wide field detector. So we're able to get a, a about a hundred micron by hundred micron field of view image of our sample with this wide field imaging system. This is what things look like when we uh, focus down the green laser light. So within this particular image, uh, no microwave fields are engaging the NV centers. We simply focus down the green light. Technically, well, we've, we've defocused it a bit and that you see the rings of the defocus very nicely imprinted into our NV center photoluminescence. And so this is just a spin coated Adamas nano diamond sample on a substrate, slightly defocused green. Uh, and the sort of features of this defocus spot are directly seen in our wide field image. And as we defocus things further and further to flood illuminate our field of view, we see fluorescence throughout the field of view, stronger and weaker, depending on exactly how, how well the, the, the region of the sample is coded. And so now we use this instrument to, to, to make a wide field image. Uh, one sort of technical detail was we discovered in doing this, that if we just swept the microwaves and tried to record images, we had some issues with noise. Uh, and so there was very, quite a bit of variation in the signal as we were doing this and, and this masked some of the uh, environmental imprint we wanted to read out of the, the, the spin modulated photoluminescence. And so this is just some detail of how we, we dealt with it. Uh, the main idea is we take a photoluminescence image with zero microwave frequency and then an image with uh, microwave frequency that we fix applied and we take the difference of those two to remove any sort of slow variations in the, in the signal that we're seeing. And then we record and we record this wide field image frame by frame and take their difference to get the image that we actually do our data processing on. So here 
is just an example. This is the fluorescence image of our sample and now moving across our detector in the two directions at every single pixel with one shot. So this is really the added value of this kind of instrument. You don't have to scan point by point to build up uh, the, the spin resonance data. Here we see at every pixel uh, an ODMR signal. And so once we're able to do that, we've started using this instrument to look at a, a variety of um, different kinds of samples. This one, it was as much uh, a uh, less interest, let's say, in the device that we're looking at here. And what this is, is there's some nickel that we've coated onto a silicon substrate that we can then run current through. This was as much uh, a calibration tool to convince ourselves we could do not only wide field magnetic imaging, but also temperature imaging using the, the responsivity of the NV center electronic structure that, to these two environmental parameters. Uh, and so what you see here, along the two columns, column C and column D. These are magnetic field maps of the device as a function of applied current. These are temperature maps of that same device as a function of applied current. You'll notice point one and point two in both of these panels or columns. And those just correspond to at those particular locations, what we determine the temperature and magnetic field to be as we change that drive current. Now, because the nickel is ferromagnetic, even at zero current, there is some finite magnetic field that we're seeing there, which makes sense. Uh, and then, of course, as we increase the current, we expect things to both get hot and the magnetic field to increase. And, and that's exactly what we see here. So this really was the, the device that, or, the, or the, the, first, the, the first sample that we looked at where we were able to say, okay, we have this tool up and running. And then, or now we've started to try to use it to look at systems that maybe are a little bit more interesting. And so the, the first application of that is in the area of spintronics. And so what we've been looking at recently are uh, FGT thin films. And so these are, are materials that can possess uh, finite magnetization. So these are thin materials that can, can become ferromagnetic. Uh, and we are trying to look at now take advantage of the resolution that we have with our tool to study the spatial distribution of the magnetization in FG, FGT. And so again, here is that sample chuck that we have zoomed in to where the sample sits inside of the fee, the, 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 the microwave strip line waveguide that comes into the, the space of interest. Here is a microscope image just of the material itself before we coat it with, with nanodiamonds. Here is that same image, but now the registration, instead of a wide field reflectance map of what we're looking at with white light, we're actually looking at the, the photoluminescence generated across the device. Uh, regions where uh, there's big reductions in photoluminescence are because things are metallic. And now what we do here is we take uh, a B-field image of the whole device at a finite bias. So we have those Helmholtz coils, we put them up to 0.45 millitesla, and then from a single snapshot, where we take these pairs of snapshots as a function of microwave frequency, then we can back out uh, the magnetic field at each one of these pixels, like we saw in the previous uh, slide. And what's interesting here is when we now remove that bias field, we're able to see the region of our FGT thin film that stays magnetized. So now we're using these kind of data sets to study within this material. And you'll see uh, in the next slide, another thin, thin film material, really the spatial structure of how the magnetic domains are forming within, within these materials. So it's really giving us, again, a sensitivity and a resolution that, that, that you might not get with other uh, techniques that could get at the same kind of data. So here's a second example in, in the world of, of 2D materials where we're again looking at room temperature ferromagnetism, but now in these very thin monolayer films. Here's the crystal structure of either tungsten uh, sulfide or molybdenum sulfide. And in, if you look now from the top view, what we, we've worked with some collaborators to occasionally replace some of the atoms with iron atoms. So we have iron uh, tungsten sulfide and iron molybdenum sulfide. And what we are interested in is learning how does the iron, the presence of the iron in these films influence the magnetic properties of the material. And there's some predictions that this particular material should become ferromagnetic at room temperature uh, with the right concentration of iron, iron atoms within the material. Uh, and so we set out to try to help this team uh, study that effect with, with our, again, our microscope and the sort of data set that confirmed that 
uh, were two. There is the usual magnetic field versus magnetization plots that one does who when you're studying the, the magnetic properties of a material. And so for the, the tungsten sulfide sample, basically when you understand the details of these curves tell you whether it's paramagnetic, diamagnetic, ferromagnetic. Uh, from this curve here, you can conclude that it's paramagnetic. Uh, the opening of this eye or this hysteresis loop that we see in this plot here tells us that this is certainly ferromagnetic for comparison or the undoped uh, material HM curves. Uh, and then now in our microscope, right, we know that we get a shift in the, the splitting of the, of those, the spin resonance dips if there is a local magnetic field. So in addition to this, this sort of ensemble measurement that is done to demonstrate the ferromagnetic ferromagnetism at room temperature, we have now this local measurement on the sample at one particular spot where we see, in, we, we, we certainly see a shifting in the peaks of the spin resonance. And this is indicative of the magnetic field that is being generated by this ferromagnet. Uh, in the other material where it wasn't expected to see any kind of ferromagnetism, uh, we see no shift in the spin dips. And so this is confirmation, in fact, that this material, this 2D material doped with iron is giving us ferromagnetism. And this is really the first observation of that effect in this kind of material. And the, the diamond microscope was part of confirming that this was indeed the case. So the third uh, application is, so now we were first, we're looking at small things. We'll keep looking at small things, but it's to study something big. Uh, and so uh, full disclosure, as I go into these next few slides, we really bring the hammer to this party, I guess. Like I'm not a geophysicist, but I have a very smart geophysical collaborator. Uh, and he, and so basically he is interested. And so through him, I'm interested in questions about the formation of the moon. And so remarkably, uh, Paleomagnetism gives one a way to learn about the formation and evolution of any body, uh, but in this case, the, the body that's being studied is the moon. And so there's questions, uh, just really basic questions about how the moon was formed. Was it through a gravi gravitational accretion process? Was there kind of an impact between two bodies that then gave rise to this third body? And so really, we, I guess I've come to learn, we don't really know the answer to that question. And what is surprising, is, as I just said, is that uh, magnetic properties at the surface of a body can tell you quite a bit about the, the kind of the origin story of that, of that body. And so uh, just to remind you, right, our Earth has a magnetic field associated with it. Uh, we've probably all known that since we were, were, were small children. If we ever played with a compass, it's responsive to that local magnetic field and it helps one, one get around. Uh, maybe. You didn't know at the time, and you know, I didn't know till much later that why the heck do we have that magnetic field? Uh, and it has to do with what's going on inside the, the earth and actually how it was formed. Uh, and so the reason we have that, that external magnetic field is that uh, basically in the formation process of the earth, it led to a, a inner molten core that is completely produced, or excuse me, solid iron core, which sits in the middle. And then we have this kind of ionic core of iron and nickel that sits outside of that inner solid core. And because of that, this, the, the liquid is able to move. And so there is rotation and there's convective motions of this iron nickel mix that creates current loops. And as soon as you have a current loop that creates for us a magnetic field. And so studying the magnetic field on the surface of the earth uh, let's one learn about history of the earth, of course, but also details of this inner, inner, not quite the inner core, but this outer core of, of, of the earth. And so we call this magnetic field that's generated through this convection and rotational motion of this liquid, uh, the earth's dynamo. Now, right now, if you were to make a measurement on the surface of the moon, the way you would do that is we don't take our you know, diamond microscope up onto the surface of the moon, some stuff comes back from the moon to us. Uh, and right now, if you were to measure rocks from the moon, there's no indication that there is a magnetic field on its surface. Uh, now, just because there is no lunar dynamo right now, it doesn't mean one never existed. And the existence and the features of this dynamo tell you about or provide a potential explanation for how the moon might have formed. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is a plot from this nice review paper on the lunar dynamo. And here, is a time axis. And here is the, basically the magnetic field, what's called paleo intensity and paleomagnetism. Uh, and, and 
you know, there's some theories about what the strength of that field could be. And what was interesting in these data points that were, were plotted here is that if you look back to a fairly long time ago, there seems to be a window when there was a lunar dynamo. Uh, and more recently, that, that has gone away. Now, the way that these kind of measurements work is you actually take a rock from the surface of the moon. And inside of this rock, there are magnetic inclusions that carry what's called a remnant magnetization associated with them. And this remnant magnetization gives you a magnetic field that lets you make a statement about the generation process for that magnetic field. Now, the rocks are dated in one way to figure out this axis, and then other magnetometers are used to try to measure the paleo intensity. And so questions related to the dynamo, was it only this window of time? Could we learn something in this window if we had more sensitive sensors? These are all open questions that are still, you know, people are actively looking at to this day. So of course, there's an opportunity here, the quantum diamond microscope, and this is how I, I teamed up with my partner at the U of R, uh, John Tarduno. He came to me just kind of in much better <laughs> describing what I was just sharing with you uh, and said, you know, Nick, basically, if we can measure uh, small rock with high sensitivity, we have an opportunity to put you know, better resolve, but also different data points on this kind of a plot. And the reason is the most sensitive magnetometers like a, a squid magnetometer are as sensitive as an NV center diamond microscope, uh, but the spatial resolution isn't as good, right? And so these inclusions are small within the rocks. Uh, and here is an image of a, a rock. So this is what John brought over to our lab. Uh, this was brought back. So this is like the, thing, the only thing that gets my kids excited when I tell them we look at a rock from Apollo 11 that came back from the moon in the lab. They can't quite believe that. Uh, but there are magnetic inclusions that can be identified through other microscopy techniques that we then want to learn about the magnetic field strength of those mag magnetic inclusions. And being able to have the spatial resolution to really look at individual inclusions and not having to average over the ensemble of them allows you to have a more sensitive and better resolved measurement. And so one challenge of doing this is that if magnetization is our memory, right, we don't want to do something that can potentially distort or bias or erase that uh, magnetization. And so most diamond microscopes and ours for, typically would put a, through that Helmholtz coil, a, a DC magnetic field as the background to, to break that spin degeneracy. But so actually a solution that has been really nice in these experiments is the nano diamonds. Remember that middle term in the Hamiltonian, there's a spin, excuse me, a strain differentiation on the spin ground state. So that's another way that uh, the degeneracy is broken in the material. So by working with strained nano diamonds, we don't necessarily need a background magnetic field of the same level to do our quantum diamond microscopy. And so it allows us to look at samples that are sensitive to the environmental magnetization. In addition, we came up with, uh, you know, not so sophisticated, but certainly useful way of looking at these lunar rocks uh, and essentially making uh, PDMS films of nano diamonds that would allow us to put the film. So, uh, you know, we, we ideally would like to have uh, uh, an array of nano diamonds separated by a bit more than our diffraction limited spot size that we could then put on the sample and make a magnetic image. And I mean, if we could then shift that control controllably, that would be fantastic. So we're working on that right now. What we do is, a fairly low density of nano diamonds within a PDMS film, we can put it onto our sample. Uh, it lets us look at a sample, but then take it off and then put a new one back onto the sample. And it helps just for uh, throughput as we're, as, we're making, as we're making these measurements. And so here uh, are our first, and so this is exciting for us, uh, our first ODMR images on actually this, this inclusion right back here. And so we're able to get, uh, ODMR splittings and, and magnetic field strengths that are, are sort of reasonable for what one might expect from the type of rock that we're looking at. So this is just kind of fresh out of the oven. And so I'm hoping there's gonna be a lot more to come with this in, in the next weeks and months as, as we continue to look at these samples and work with John on this, on this project. Okay, so I, I see it takes us to about 1230. Change gears a little bit and I'll maybe go a bit, I won't rush through this, but maybe be a bit quicker so, so we can be done by, by, by quarter of. Uh, uh, any there is no any restrictions with um, uh, oh, okay. so that's kind of feel okay. free as okay. you. All right, thank you. Have uh, information to please. 
Yeah, that's right. But I also know from when I'm attending talks, around 40 or 45 minutes is when I start, if I can make it that long. So uh, being you know, cognizant of the, the, the audience helps. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is our uh, optical tweezer in high vacuum, uh, either levitated optomechanics or when we're working with nitrogen vacancy centers and nanodiamonds, uh, levitated spin optomechanics. The optical physics part of this is there is a, a, essentially a time average force a dielectric particle will feel when it's at the focus of a high NA objective. Uh, this plot is capturing how the intensity of that focused field looks, okay? The potential that results from that focused field and the force that the dielectric particle will feel as a result of the gradient of the irradiance. Now, if you're an uh, expert in optical tweezers, you know there's also a scattering force that can come into play. Uh, and the scattering force, instead of restoring the particle to the focus, will tend to kick the particle along the direction of your tweezing beam. Here, because our particles are, are much smaller than the wavelength of our trapping beam, we can safely neglect that contribution to the force. And so why that is nice is, Looking in this again direction is transverse to the beam propagation direction here. Uh, we have a oscillation that at least for small displacements from our focal point is going to be very much like a harmonic oscillator. <clears throat> and we can recast now the spring constants of our levitated nanoparticle uh, in terms of properties of our trap and the polarizability of the particle. This is the power of the trap. This is the numerical aperture and wavelength. Uh, and when you do this, looking, say, at one direction, this is the x direction here, things along the optical axis, which would be z, you see are slightly different than the things that are in the direction transverse to the optical axis. Uh, at the end of the day, the motion of this particle in this x direction, if the environmental pressure is just right, becomes that of a, a harmonic oscillator with a fluctuating force that depends on details of the environment as well as the trapping beam itself and even possibly when we start making measurements of the particle via the light that scatters away quantum mechanical back action that acts on the particle. In our trapping experiments the size we work with is typically about 100 nanometer diameter. Here's the masses and then the types of resonance frequencies that we get for these optically levitated particles is in the range of 100 kilohertz. Particle size is important because the wavelength with respect to the particle size determines whether or not we can neglect that scattering force. So if we tried to put, say, a half a micron particle into this single beam uh, gradient force trap, the particle is just too big and uh, always gets kicked out of the trap, so we can't grab onto it. So what's exciting for us, and this is something we've also been working on for a number of years, is using nano diamonds, so using dielectric nanoparticles that are also, also optically active. Uh, and what's interesting for that is the spin have, is a potential handle to do interesting optomechanics experiments with. Uh, and the idea is that, I guess I haven't said, well, what's, why, why the heck would one wanna make a mechanical oscillator using light in high vacuum? Well, what's nice is that the fact that you've decoupled your mechanical oscillator from any kind of substrate you have essentially quieted or turned off channels for dissipation and decoherence. So you can end up with a mechanical oscillator in this optical glove that has quality factors that can approach 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. Uh, and so these are extremely high Q mechanical resonators. And it's just because you don't have any connection to a substrate. And if one were now able to take this harmonic oscillator and take energy out of it and put it into its quantum, its, you know, transition it from a classical to a quantum harmonic oscillator. And just remind you that the degree of freedom I'm talking about is the center of mass of this particle that's caught in the trap. Uh, then there's an opportunity to do, to do quantum optomechanics where you would have extremely long coherence times and potentially huge mechanical sensitivities that just result because of this quality factor and the fact that it's so isolated from the, the, the environment that it sits in. And because of that, when you add in the spin degree of freedom, there's a number of proposals to how one might couple this mechanical motion of the particle, the nanodiamond in this case, I don't know, to the spin that's living inside of it. And this is what actually got me excited about these experiments now, probably eight or nine years ago, the, this sort of holy grail experiment we, we still are slowly making progress on would be to, to take this levitated nanodiamond, and I'll describe in a slide or two how one can 
actively take energy out of the harmonic oscillator, put that into its quantum mechanical ground state. So the center of mass motion, which is a hard harmonic oscillator, is into its ground state. And then doing this in the presence of a magnetic field gradient, where you optically modulate the ground state spin of your NV center that lives inside of this nano diamond, right? And if you do this just right, you can create exotic quantum mechanical states where the center of mass of the nano diamond itself is displaced dependent on the orientation of the spin. All right, so you can create these somewhat mesoscopic entangled states between the particle center of mass motion and the spin that lives inside of the nitrogen vacancy center. And so because of that possible feature to make cat states in this system, there was proposals to do extremely sensitive uh, mass spectroscopy. Over here is an example of just doing interferometry with this kind of um, entangled spin nano diamond center of mass state. And there's a variety of other proposals how you might use this to do matter wave and interferometry. And all of these things at the end of the day require being able to generate this state. So it requires learning, knowing a lot about the properties of the NV center spin as you try to operate the system at a uh, high vacuum and ultra high vacuum. Is it possible to do these in an optical trap? Are there other obstructions that come up that make it not possible? And so this is the path we're going down right now as we, I said, slowly make progress on trying to get to a point where some of these exciting proposals could actually be realized in the laboratory. The, 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 the apparatus that kind of the science apparatus where all the magic happens, uh, we have a trap laser that is modulated by an electro-optic modulator. It also goes through an acousto-optic modulator to slightly shift the frequency with respect to the, to the EOM path. Now, the EOM path is the, the laser that creates the potential well that the particle sees. So it has a much higher power than the AOM path. The AOM path in this particular experiment is just a probe, so it becomes frequency shifted, so it doesn't interfere with the EOM path. And then it also allows us to to study the motion of the particle when it passes through the chamber. So we have a collection of detectors on the back end of the system that just from looking at the scattered light can tell us about the motion of the particle and the focus of our trapping beam. In addition, right, don't forget about it, the fact that within this nano diamond is an NV center. So we have a green laser line that comes in that will optically actuate the NV center. We have a microwave and spectrum analyzer rigged up into this chamber. So this is kind of a blow up cartoon of what's going on in the focus of the, of the high NA trapping objective. And then there's a channel to collect this fluorescence and either look at the spectrum, do uh, correlation measurements or energy correlation measurements on the light that comes out to learn about the photon statistics of the light that we're receiving. So there's a lot of uh, bells and whistles on this. The most important one, if you wanna take energy out of the system is taking what you know about the position and we built a suite of custom electronics uh, in collaboration with Lucas Novotny's group that allowed us to measure the position and from knowing the position, change the details of the EOM trapping path. Remember, we can modulate the power in such a way that we can actually cause dissipation or an optical damping to happen for this levitated nanoparticle. What do a, what a data sets look like? Oops, typo there, that should be an I. Um, yeah, so here is just looking at one of the channels as a function of time to convince you that, yeah, we do see harmonic motion. If we look at the, the, the Fourier transforms of the three different position channels that we measure, we see these very nice peaks in the, in the photocurrent spectrum that occur at the frequency of the oscillation. We have three separate harmonic oscillators uh, because, as you might remember, when you focus uh, a, a light, in particular a, a laser with a high NA objective, you get a... Um, asymmetric focal volume that is longer along the optical axis. It is narrower in the transverse direction that is orthogonal to the incoming linear polarization of the light. Uh, and then it's a bit wider in the direction that's parallel to that linear polarization. And because the, the, so because the curvature along these three directions is different, it results in an optical spring. Constant is slightly different that then results in frequency differentiation for the three directions of oscillation. So in fact, this optically levitated uh, nanoparticle can, is, is moving in three different directions with frequencies that are all slightly different. So it's really a, a multimodal harmonic oscillator. That's really useful because what you can do is you can measure, right? Any one of these three oscillation directions 
and then feed back onto it individually by modulating the power as seen by that particular oscillator. So that's exactly the kinds of things that we're doing. So looking at one of these current frequency or photocurrent spectrums for the X oscillation mode here is in, in the system we have in Rochester, we've, we've taken this down to about you know, 800 millikelvin by just actuating the power along that particular direction in just the right way. Uh, so we, I think the best weed around maybe is like a thousand, if you think in terms of phonons for these oscillators, maybe a thousand phonons in, the, in a given mode. We've actually spent quite a bit of time doing other, other uh, experiments related to like mechanical lasing in this system, but uh, not working with nanodimes, working with silica beads, groups have shown that you can in fact take this system all the way down to its quantum mechanical ground state by uh, feeding back on the motion in, in just the right way. So kind of half of the story is there at least getting to the, the ground state of the center of mass. And if there are ways to couple the, the if there are ways to do this with the nano diamond and then bring the spin into the story, there's lots of exciting science that can be done. So with the nano diamonds and the traps, the kind of things we have done is measured the photoluminescence spectrum, uh, done this with nano diamonds that contain just one NV center. And that's evidenced in this kind of energy uh, autocorrelation plot. This plot here essentially takes the stream of photons leaving the trap and puts them on a beam splitter and just ask the questions, if I get a click on detector one, what is the likelihood I get a click on detector two? Detector one is the transmission detector, detector two is the reflection detector. And asking that question when there's no time delay between when I ask it, uh, if I have a stream of single photons, then that better, that's, there's gonna be zero chance of that event happening because if my photon has reflected, it can't transmit or vice versa. And so this is a, a kind of a, a, a typical uh, trace that one sees if they want to, to demonstrate that the light source is giving them single photons. So we just wanted to convince ourselves we had an NV center in our nano diamond and we had one NV center only. Uh, and then we've done things like uh, optically detected magnetic resonance on the trap. And there's some, some, some details about doing this in high vacuum being held with a laser beam instead of a substrate that you have to be mindful of. Uh, for example, we, we've noticed there's a shift in these ODMR spectra that happens when you first start to pull vacuum. Um, but after we make that pull, it stays pretty much consistent as we continue to do the experiments uh, and, and being able to, of course, uh, look at the ODMR spectrum is a function of power. We can learn about the temperature of our NV center. So here's an example of just using that sensitivity of the center of the, of the, the, the ODMR um, spectra to, to learn about the temperature of our mechanical oscillator in a trap. And then finally, we've been just recently, or maybe kind of recently, looking to see if we can coherently control the spins. And so what we're showing here is from our, our ODMR data sets uh, doing something that is time resolved, where we now vary the window of time that we actuate with our microwave to get some kind of Rabi oscillations. Uh, and the two different data sets here, the blue and the red, uh, are looking at the same NV center. Uh, but what we've done is we've chopped the traps, so this is a bit of a detail, the optical trap is influencing the spin photophysics here. And that's evidenced by, for example, in this particular plot, the contrast is better when we chop the trap as opposed to let it just continuously hold the, the nano diamond. And then in these two configurations, either with the trap chopped or just letting it sit continuous, we, we look at the Rabi oscillations and the, and the light that we get back in the PL. And from that Rabi oscillation, we can extract T2 times. And so, across the range of powers that we're looking, the T2 is stable. That's not huge right now, but at least it's consistent with what one would expect if we were to look at like macro bulk type 1B diamonds. Uh, so it was nice to see, to see that and to, to get this data set. Understanding the spin coherence time is going to be important if we are going to sort of push the envelope on trying to do these kind of superposition experiments between the center of mass and the, and the spin. All right, I apologize a few minutes past uh, past 45 minutes. Uh, I appreciate everybody's attention and it, and it was really nice to, to share with you some of the work that we've been doing both with our quantum diamond microscope and, uh, and in this area of levitated spin optomechanics, both enabled by the, the material that we, we get from Adamas. Uh, and of course, like anytime you hear these talks, this isn't the work of the person doing the talking, it's the work of many folks. I've been fortunate, at least in these activities, to collaborate with a number of faculty members, both at the U of R and outside of it. Uh, a number of really talented students and postdocs have worked on these experiments and other experiments that we do in the lab. And I've been fortunate to have uh, funding from a variety of different sources uh, within 
then both the Department of Defense as well as the National Science Foundation and even the UFR has also been very supportive of the work that I've been doing. So uh, thank you for the invitation again and your, all your attention and I'm happy to, to take questions if people have any. And Nick, thank you very much on behalf of the audience for your beautiful talk on this so wide range of topics you touched. It's unbelievable. It's, uh, so uh, uh, probably while uh, our audience think about their questions or, ah, actually we started to get already. On the I see a nice question that said, do magnetic impurities in nano diamond influence your results? Uh, that's a good question. So heaven, thought too much about that but anything that is going to change the 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 magnetic environment of the of the of the envy center will influence the result so if you had if this magnetic impurity so maybe be a little more explicit if we were doing something with trying to measure the spin coherence times and there were magnetic impurities that are fluctuating within the nano diamond in the vicinity of the NV center then of course those fluctuating impurity magnetic fields are going to dephase uh the the spin physics that we're, we're observing and it's gonna influence the results that we have. To be honest, the bigger problem we have, or the biggest obstruction right now is that we can't get to the vacuum levels that are required to do some of the experiments that let you take the center of mass down to the ground state. So we're not sure if that's just a, a feature of, it could be just a, a not a technical issue, it could be a fundamental issue, just the fact that we have uh, even one impurity, in this case, the impurity for us is the thing we wanna to talk to, the NV center within the nano diamond, the, just the fact that that will absorb some light. And as you start to pull vacuum, you're, you're turning off dissipation channels for heat. And so at some point, the nano diamond just can't withstand the, the, the amount of optical energy that's being converted into heat within the material and then it can't persist but that's slightly speculative but we're trying to figure out how do we even get to temperatures or excuse me pressures that are low enough to allow us to start to try to see if we can put it to the ground state for its center of mass yeah the biggest biggest particles we have trapped uh have had diameters of 300 nanometers those weren't necessarily the nano diamonds these are uh, silica beads but once we, for, and that's conditioned on the fact that we are working with a, a, I didn't say the wavelength of our trapping laser is 1064 nanometers. If we were to move to a longer wavelength laser, we could trap um, larger particles. Now, if we wanted to trap larger particles because of, and only use one laser, then you just have to have a longer wavelength. Um, of course, we could trap particles that were bigger in our system if we were able to turn off the scattering force that I told you we neglect in our experiment. So the scattering force pushes along the optical axis in the direction of your laser beam that's doing the trapping. If we wanted to trap, say, micron particles in our trap, what we would have to do is on the end, on the other side of our focusing objective, so that basically the light comes down up, is recolumated, and we have to put a mirror. And if we could create a standing wave trap uh, with the 1064, then we effectively um, cancel out the scattering force. And then the one laser can trap the particle, but now you need to have it propagating along the two different directions. There is another question from Viva Horovitz. Yeah, Viva, do, do you have the ability to select which? <laughs> I wish we did. Uh, right now, the way we, we load the trap uh, is we use an nebulizer and create an aerosol that contains whatever the object we would like to trap and we just blow it in to the kind of a lousy thing to do if you're trying to pull the vacuum but we blow it into the vacuum chamber at atmosphere and then collisions with the gas remove energy and if that happens within the focal region then the particle can get stuck in our optical trap and then we see like in this image we see right here you would see this bright glow and it would persist and then we'd start like pumping down the chamber. That's the operationally how we do it. Uh, there are ways with piezoelectrics to sort of delaminate uh, nanoparticles from a surface and, and load the trap that way. That approach is, is, is very important if you wanna to go to ultra high vacuum because you don't wanna be spraying stuff in and you wanna have a way if you're losing, if you're losing particles in your trap to reload it. So in vacuum, you could kick a particle off and then maybe have a laser beam that comes down every so often to try to be that thing that takes the energy away, like another optical force, and then load it into your trap. When I, when I have people in the lab, if 
the, the, the way from where we spray to the size of the spot, it's like to get the particle loaded in the trap, uh, I'll give it in yards, but it's like hitting a hole in one on a 500 yard golf hole, getting this particle into that trap. When you think about the sizes and the distances, and the reason we're able to get holes in one is because we also are taking like a billion <laughs> or a million shots at the hole every time we do a puff of, of the nebula. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just because uh, I'm actually working on a technique for, um, for sorting diamonds according to their properties. Okay. And so you would be able to, so like, maybe can you unpack that a little more for me? I'd be interested. Um, microfluidic sorting. Okay. And so properties being uh, size or like what? Well, ideally I would be able to anchor particles in the microfluidics, test things like uh, perhaps their coherence time, which would take some time and yep. then release them according to their properties. But that's kind of a holy grail. It's it's it's, it's far off. Yeah, it's like you have company too. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I just finished my maternity leave. Oh, congratulations! Uh, yeah, we we would love. It would be awesome if we could do things like, of course, as, as you said, the just it would be a holy grail for us two to be able to take exactly the sample we knew we wanted and put it in there, uh, and maybe take it out and then put it back in. But right now, that's just not uh, something that that we're able to do. And maybe also the last related question, Nick, for your uh, levitation experiments, uh, putting silica shell on uh, surface of nano diamonds, uh, would it be useful? It will reduce, say, refractive index. You can maybe use larger size of diamond, and maybe it also can stabilize and decenter performance. Uh, what I yeah. worry that when you put diamond, there are surface groups, right? And also yeah. some SP2 hedges. Mm -hmm. And when environment is changed, surface groups start to be even delaminated from diamond surface. Yes. And if there is uh, no, say, carboxylic groups on the surface, then limpons um, will start to form some SP2 yep. hedges. And this can be maybe a source where yep. electron can be stilled from an center. So stabilizing the surface with some shells probably yeah. might be useful. Do you do anything in that direction? Yeah, so that, that's uh, a good point. And uh, so kind of, I didn't really talk, speak to this in the, the talk. When we first tried maybe in 2013 to do these experiments, we thought, being the levitation experiments with nanodimes, oh, this is going to be easy. We're just going to put these into the trap. We know how to trap beads. We're going, to, we're going to be able to do a number of interesting things because of the envy center and the spin. And we, and as experiments sometimes go, like the first day we actually started trying, maybe like the third or fourth time, boom, we caught an envy center. We were using uh, envy centers that had around uh, four or 500, you know, the, the kind of ensemble nanodiamonds. And after we saw this one that was bright and we had photoluminescence and you know, maybe we turned off the system, went to lunch and came back and then it was weeks, we couldn't see anything anymore and weeks and weeks and weeks. So we were not sure what to do. So we actually, there was a collaborator, I can't remember her name because it was a while ago, but the, there was a, you know, we had a paper in Nature Photonics when we first did this and she's on this, Eva, and I can't think of her last name, but we sent them uh, nano diamonds uh, and then we had them coated in silica and it just turned out when we sent them the nano diamonds, we sent them both the uh, versions that had the ensembles and the nano diamonds that had one to four in them, uh, just because they were going to work on it. And it's just that once they started doing it, they said it was easy for them to coat a number of different sizes and, and, and densities. And so when those came back, we had hoped that they were going to passivate the surfaces and, and some of the things you mentioned might improve the ability to trap, improve photoluminescence. And it still turned out that the larger ones didn't fluoresce. But when we, we said, well, let's just try the smaller ones, because we thought at that point we were having an issue collecting photoluminescence signal as much as anything. So then we put the, the smaller being the one to four in with the coating. And, you know, like magic, you know, every time we trapped one, we were seeing photoluminescence. And occasionally we we're seeing single ones because of just like the randomness and how we were doing it. And so then we thought, okay, great, you know, the coding helped. And it, it, but then it, so we wrote the paper and then we decided, well, let's just 
go back and we, cause we never actually tried the one before uncoded just because we thought they were going to be too hard. You know, we wanted to start with those going to be the brightest and easiest. So I we went back and it turned out even those ones that weren't coded, but had just a few nitrogen vacancies also were routinely fluorescing in the trap. Uh, and so at least for the initial experiments, the, the coding wasn't making much of a difference, but I do think surface, you know, surface contamination or other, uh, you know, non-ideal surface properties in the long run need to be, be sort of dealt with if we are really going to be pushing some of these experiments I was talking about, because I think that those can be part of the source of maybe even like a local heat sources through absorption that cause problems in going to lower temperature. Uh, you, as you said, if, the, if it's close to the surface because the crystal size is small, that's gonna influence the, the, the spin, spin physics we would like to see. And so I do think shells are a useful way to go. And it was just the way we, we kind of went to them and then moved away from them and haven't gone back yet just because I don't think the other side of the, the experiment is quite there yet where the shells are, are, are necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do we have more questions? Oh, I can ask another then. <laughs> so, so Nick, for your experiments with quantum microscope, can you uh, please elaborate a little bit more on nanodiamonds that you used for, the, for those experiments to sprinkle them over substrate for mapping of temperature and magnetic fields? Yeah. Uh, what sizes are, uh, do you, and maybe mostly for us as kind of people who try to improve quality of the material you work with, uh, yeah. what would be your desirable um, quantities for those diamonds? What you would like to see from them? What yeah, so I mean, we, we've done those experiments with, uh, I mean, I have a list, I didn't actually put it into the, the, the presentation and but we've worked with the high density nano diamonds in those experiments and the sizes can be range from a hundred to a few hundred nanometers. Uh, for honest, to, to be honest, what, and I, and I did say this in the talk, what would be for where we are, what, what would be best? I mean, if you could do the sorting, I mean, to just let's say the, the dream substrate would be a sorted one where we knew each kind of the, 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 the photophysical spin spin physical properties of the nano diamonds, and then we also had had an array of them where we were able to situate them in space with a spacing that we could dictate, and that would be really useful. Uh, and it had them in a like that's why this PMS stamp is sort of a, a half baked way of getting there. But if we had a way to sort of stick something onto the in the, in the rock experiment, especially something we wanted to measure, and but mm -hmm. we because we you know we kind of calibrated all of the, the sensors already, you could move that around and, and measure different different samples. So uh, at the moment, the way we've done our measurements, because we're not really pushing uh, the quantum control and trying to get the highest magnetic field sensitivity that we, that we could have, I, we're not so worried about the, uh, it's not the sample quality that's limiting us right now, it's just our ability to prepare the, the sensor bit of the diamond microscope that would, would, would be, if we could do it more regular with a bit more um, certainty of what was going on at each location, mm -hmm. that would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, 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 please let us know if there are more questions. Uh, it was very comprehensive talk, uh, very educational. And uh, uh, probably uh, somebody can have more questions in the future. So, yeah. uh, I would have another question concerning the optical tweezer that you set up. And uh, it's about have you tried different wavelengths uh, in your setup? So, lower ones, for example. Well, I, I didn't catch that last part. Uh, so, so lower wavelengths, for example, so closer to the, the emission wavelengths of the ND center. Yeah, so, uh, so we have not tried to trap with the optical transition wavelength of the NV center, but uh, an experiment uh, on a sheet of paper, not in practice yet, that we've talked about uh, was to stick with the 1064, or even you could do longer. We, we've done 
slightly longer wavelengths and we've done slightly smaller wavelengths for trapping. But what's interesting here is the size of the particle with respect to the trapping wavelength. We would like that to be a, a large disparity. So actually longer wavelength means we can work with slightly bigger particles. Uh, but as long as the particle is like the, say the, the diameter or the radius is about a tenth of the wavelength, then we are in the regime where we can trap with one beam. And so the, the experiment on paper that we haven't tried to do yet is, and I think this is kind of maybe what you're alluding to or thinking about, right, is we have a defect or an atom in a solid now. So all of the tools people use in atom and ion trapping with laser beams can be brought to bear on the internal structure of the NV center. Uh, and so the experiments we wanted to do that we haven't done yet would be to, with a laser that is resonant, let's say with the zero phonon line in the NV center, try, or, or maybe not a laser, maybe other light sources, try to see what is the smallest optical force we could measure. And the optical force now would be on the optical transition of the zero phonon line. And would there be a way that we could take, say, our laser coherent state and attenuate it down? So on average, it has some, maybe few, maybe one photon associated with it. And can we measure the, the radiation pressure as we send these individual photon wave packets through the, the levitated nanoparticle. So the center of mass might displace a little bit every time you get an optical force on this resonant transition within the NV center. So, so we have, a, and, and so I guess the, the, that's the long-winded, you know, you kind of jog something. The short is we have never tried to trap a particle with the, with the like the optical transition of the NV center without some other uh, glove beam. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so in the nano diamond arrays, really the, the field of view we have is about 100 micron by 100 micron. Uh, the spot size is, we are, is, about, is about a micron. So probably every three microns on just even a, a, a square lattice would be, would be, would be nice. Mm -hmm. So we had talked, we've talked about, we haven't done it, you know, it's easy to talk, hard to do always, is trying to create like a, a if we had a way to create, um, what's that? I'm at a loss, maybe for talking for so long, I've lost the words I wanted to say, make a, a lattice with a laser beam. I don't know what the right word is, but maybe, like make an interference pattern. Yes, maybe. Yeah, like have some laser interference pattern that mm -hmm. creates this uh, array structure that we want and then do it in a, in a like a, a UV curable fluid or something where we could then optical tweeze nano diamonds at all of the higher radiance points and then cure the thing, turn the lasers off and then go away with it. That was one, one thing where something like that, but that was just like a, again, we didn't really move forward on it because mm -hmm. just like a you know, person power always is, a, is sometimes limiting <laughs> to all the ideas you mm -hmm. can push forward. But it really is outside of the, you know, a few diffraction limited spot sizes so that there's no crosstalk between the different, uh, the different uh, nano diamonds. And of course, the more precisely that we can position those with respect to some reference point would, is going to be valuable information because ultimately, at least in the rock experiment, you're going to want to do some measurements that, that, that let you really figure out things related, not just to the local magnetic field that you're measuring, but you might need to make like two different measurements to then do an in kind of inverse to what is the details of the magnetization that is sitting within that particular rock. So mm -hmm. there's an inverse problem and inverse imaging thing that would have to happen. Nick, it was also a paper by MIT group on distributing diamonds over um, uh, electronic device and mm -hmm. measuring local magnetic field, which is uh, associated with this electron, local electron current, as well as temperature. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there, Diamonds were just sprinkled over yep. a surface or without any matrix associated, which is mm -hmm. kind of very easy way. Yep. Um, uh, for your rock, um, a local ma magnetic field on your rock system, why this would be a problem just to spread diamonds? And um, so we 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 initially were doing it that way, uh, and mm -hmm. we were also on the, in our the the the. Um, nickel devices that I talked about, that's how those all were measured. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just kind of cleanliness of the device and, and being able to, we'd like to converge on a sensor that we kind of calibrated 
sensor that we could then use on multiple uh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, coming back uh -huh. to the point about it you know having the same nv center and every uh -huh. oh, okay. yeah okay. That's, yeah uh -huh. we we're bummed we know that Makes paper uh -huh. we know that mit group and we know that work they were a little ahead of us and so it kind of <laughs> we we're bummed that when we saw that because of our, our work with magnetic and temperature sensing sort of we needed to come up with a way to differentiate what we had done from, from what they had done when we finally finished so uh -huh. Right. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I see, uh, I don't see any more questions, and it was actually a very, very long uh, discussion. So, yeah. your talk definitely raised a lot of uh, important questions and uh, high interest in the audience. So, again, right. we all thank you uh, for your uh, very inspiring talk today, and uh, we hope. Uh, yeah. It will be more collaborations between yeah, different Thank groups. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate the invitation, Olga. Nice to, to, to see everybody and talk soon. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Bye bye, everybody. Stay safe. Stay healthy.